This is our third virtual church service. Welcome back, ABC family and friends. 
um, join me as we welcome God into our worship time together. Heavenly Father, we welcome you into our homes and our spaces, Lord, and we thank you for another opportunity through technology to connect, um, to fellowship, and to remember that our focus should be on you. Um, sanctify this time, Lord, and um, help us to hear from you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, ABC, and welcome to Palm Sunday Worship. Virtually, I know, we're not in the sanctuary still, but we're going to worship together nonetheless. Now, if you know me at all, you know that my favorite place is not actually to be up on stage. I would much rather see other people leading worship, singing their hearts out to God on stage. And so because of that, I am so excited to tell you that we are going to have members of the Baranaga family and members of the Devon family leading worship for us this morning. But before we do that, I'm going to read to you from the Palm Sunday Scripture, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey there and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, The Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, saying, Who is this? The crowds responded, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Let's worship together. Still I will say, Blessed be the 
He's turned my morning into dancing again. He's lifted my sorrow. I can't stay silent. I must sing for his joy has come. He's turned my morning into dancing again. He's lifted my sorrow. I can't stay silent. I must sing for his joy has come. Where there once was only her, he gave his feeling hand. Where there once was only pain, he brought comfort like a friend. I feel the sweetness of his love Piercing my darkness I see the bright and morning sun As it ushers in his joyful gladness You turn my morning into dancing again You've lifted my sorrows I can't stay silent I must sing for your joy has come. You turn my morning into dancing again. You've lifted my sorrows. I can't stay silent. I must sing for your joy has come. Where there once was only hurt, you gave your healing hand. Where there once was only pain, you brought comfort like a friend. I feel the sweetness of your love, piercing my darkness. I see the bright and morning sun. As it rushes in your joyful gladness, you turn my morning into dancing again. You've lifted my sorrows. I can't stay silent. I must sing for your joy has come. Your anger lasts for a moment in time. But your favor is here and will be on me for all my lifetime. Into dancing again, you've lifted my sorrow. I can't stay silent. I must sing for your joy has come. You turn my morning. Into dancing again, you lifted my sorrow. I can't stay silent. I must sing for your joy has come.
Pastor Connie. Hi, Pastor George. We miss our ABC family so much. Uh, continue to pray for us as we go through this journey uh, through the whole world. Um, we just want to say thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your emails. Thank you for your phone calls. Phone calls. Thank you. And um, my, I called my husband's uh, facility this morning, and I talked to his nurse. He's also doing well. Um, they take fevers twice a day. They check the employees. They check the patients. They're all confined to their room. And um, just continue to pray for us because we, we all need prayer. Thank you. Hi, ABC family. Taylor and I are doing well. We're adjusting to the online schooling. We miss our friends and our teachers very much. And the best part about school is that we don't have homework. After lunch, Taylor and I play basketball and we have lots of fun. Hi, ABC family. Hi, ABC family. Thank you so much for reaching out to our family and making sure that we're doing well during this pandemic. We are praying for you guys. We definitely miss you all. And we hope that you guys are staying encouraged throughout this time. And hopefully that you guys are all practicing the Safer at Home Act that has been put into place. We definitely are. We miss going to church and interacting with you guys. You guys are our extended family. And we definitely want you to know that we are not only praying for you guys, but we're also praying for the world. And we hope that you guys are doing that as well. We hope to see you guys sooner than later. Bye, Bye everyone in the family. Stay safe. Stay home. Hi, ABC. This is the Lee family. Uh, Robert, Diane, and Aiden saying hello to all of you guys out there. Wishing you the best in this time of uh, where we're all shut in. I'm in my favorite chair right now. I'm all dressed in my house coat and I and, uh, just want to wish you guys well. And uh, Oh, Diane, get my tie. I need my church tie. Uh, once I get dressed uh, and then I can talk to you guys and let you know how we feel about what's going on right now. I, I do sleep in later, which is uh, not unusual, just a bit later than normal. Uh, Aiden is studying when he should be, and he's playing basketball other times, which is probably most of the time. And uh, Diane is taking care of me like she normally does. And uh, just want to say hello to you guys and wish the best for you. And, and I know this time everyone is uh, 
closed in and, and, and wishing you were together. And that's what we're hoping right now. Uh, we're looking forward to the times that we can all be together and, uh, and uh, greet each other. Uh, uh, not handshaking, not elbow bumping, nor fist bumping, but just kind of greeting. I, I know the hugging and all that's out, but uh, we really enjoy being with you guys and we look forward to when we're going to all be together again. Uh, so, ABC, that's us, the Lee family, out. Hi, I'm Pastor George Van Alstein, and I'm here to share with the ABC family what's happening that should be of interest to us all. So our announcements today, well, first of all, today is Palm Sunday, the beginning of Holy Week leading up to Easter, and it's an important sacred time of the church calendar wherever Christians worship, a time for us to remember the most important facts of our faith in Christ. In Wednesday's Messenger, we'll share with you some ideas about how you can have a really uh, a meaningful uh, and inspiring Good Friday experience, and we'll give you some of that help on Wednesday in the Messenger. Uh, meanwhile, during this week, you can think about Easter. We're going to focus on new life and seeds, and you're going to receive, if you're a family that has children or young people, you're going to receive in the mail uh, a kit that will help you prepare for next Sunday. And this is really a little seed-producing kit and uh, with some instructions and some meditation. And uh, uh, we put them in the mail on Friday, and then you should receive them midweek. Uh, we hope you all get them if you have family with kids. And when you get these seeds, just follow the instructions and plant them, and we'll talk about it uh, next Sunday, Easter Sunday. Another way of preparing for Easter, and we, we invite all of you to participate in this, is for us all to greet one another on Easter Sunday morning. So we're asking you to prepare a video of you or your family together, uh, whoever is in your household, saying a phrase of, uh, of praise and inspiration, such as, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive in me. You can, you, you can make up your own twist on that simple Easter proclamation. But if you'll say it with excitement, and we all join in next Easter Sunday, we'll have our own kind of sunrise service at 11. But we'll make it a sunrise uh, and then send your video to the address that you'll see in the comments section of this video. Now, take a moment to prepare for our celebration of communion uh, later in this service. We are actually going to take communion, but you have to have your own version of the elements, something representing the body of Christ, such as bread or a cracker, uh, something representing the blood of Christ, such as juice, if you don't have juice, any liquid water will do, and you'll be instructed later on. But take a little moment now to make sure you have those things. This is your little moment. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two. What comes next? Oh, yes, one. Now, here's the deacon chair, Phyllis, to continue our worship service. God bless you. It's our virtual offering time. Though we'd appreciate your real tithes and offerings, ABC continues to do the work um, supporting our congregation, our local and distant uh, communities, and so your faithful giving is appreciated. Let's go ahead and pray over the offering. Heavenly Father, we give this offering to continue your work in our congregation, um, in communities near and abroad. Um, we thank you for opportunities to give and to support our communities. Help us to be good stewards over the tithes and offerings and help us give us ideas for the best ways to use this um, um, support at this time. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Join me now as we come together before the Lord in prayer. Let's bow together. Dear Lord of truth, love, grace, and forgiveness, we come before you as a people who are separated from one another by distance and circumstance, but are unified in our thanksgiving that you have preserved us for another week and our need for our, your help in the week ahead. Your children are hurting right now, Lord, and we need a word of comfort, which only you can give. Quiet our hearts and give us that inner peace that passes understanding. We pray especially for the most vulnerable among us in the face of the disease that's going around, the, the elderly, those suffering from chronic diseases, those whose fears and anxieties threaten to overwhelm them psychologically. We pray for all of them. Be their support, and their love, and their comfort. We pray for health care workers whose jobs put them at personal risk, and their families as well. We pray for their physical and mental health. We pray for their endurance and their stamina. May they be a comfort to their patients. Keep them safe. And we pray, Lord, for other essential workers who carry on their work so that we can carry on our lives. Postal workers, delivery people, police and fire personnel, food service workers. Help them find the inner resources to keep them going. And Lord, some of our people are out of work or about to be, and we pray for them. We pray that you'll sustain their families. We pray that you'll help them to be able to put together the finances to, to live their lives and to keep together. And may we help each other in this as well. We pray for those who may already be infected by this dangerous virus, that their symptoms may be manageable, that their distress may not be too much to bear and their recovery be complete. We pray for leaders who are making difficult decisions that affect our lives. None of them have been through this before, not the president, the governor, the mayor, they're all fumbling to find their way, dealing with issues they're not prepared for. Help them to choose wisely. Help them to avoid making matters worse. Help them to lead when leadership is most important. And finally, Lord, help us to learn from this strange period in our lives the lessons that you want us to learn about knowing our place in this awesome creation of yours, about confessing our sins of self-centeredness and self-indulgence, about how we can better serve one another and lighten each other's burden. Change us through this experience to be more conformed to your will and your way. We thank you, Lord, for this wonderful season when we can meditate on the great event of your son's five final moments on earth through the celebration of Palm Sunday, Good Friday, and Easter. Give us renewed hope, renewed faith, renewed confidence, as we remind ourselves how far you were willing to go to save us from ourselves, all the way to earth and the cross and the grave. And we're thankful that's not the end of the story. We're thankful that you've taught us victory through the resurrection, through the new life offered. Help us to be ready by our preparation this week through a week of meditation for our wonderful Easter Sunday of triumph. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, your Son. When my dad was a kid, he and his two brothers would go to bed about 8.30 p.m. His grandpa would go to bed roughly at the same time as they did, and his room was right next door. Every night, my dad's grandpa prayed out loud. Now, the three boys couldn't understand what he was saying that much because he was praying in Swedish. But he would pray for them by name every night, and that part they understood. Petter. My dad remembers his grandpa saying his name in prayer. Today, we're going to eavesdrop on a prayer. 
So see if you can hear your name in it. We're reading from John 17, starting in verse 1. Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given to him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. So whose prayer are we eavesdropping in on today? This is Jesus' prayer to his heavenly Father. It's occurring at an important time, just hours before he, he is to be arrested and falsely accused and condemned and killed. In this Lenten season, we have been looking at Jesus' instructions to his disciples the last night they had together before they were ripped apart by his murder. We've called this series, When Storm Clouds Gather. Chapters 14 through 17 of the Gospel of John are the words of Jesus as he prepares his disciples for the trouble that is at their door. Whenever his followers of any era are in trouble, in this time of trouble today, these words are all the more precious, for they give us hope and peace in the midst of the storms. In chapters 14 through 16, Jesus talks directly to his disciples, but here in chapter 17, Jesus shifts his focus to talk to his heavenly Father. He would have been standing, looking up, with his hands raised, praying out loud, because that was the common prayer posture of his day. And even though the disciples are listening in, the intimacy and the belonging in prayer tell us that Jesus' concentration, his attention, his interaction is really two-way between earth and heaven, between Son and Father. This prayer gives us a glimpse of Jesus' heart. It's called the beloved chapter of the beloved gospel. The first part of Jesus' prayer, which we have read, is about himself in relationship to his Father. Now, I love praying scripture. The Bible gives me words and thoughts that I couldn't come up with on my own, gives me guidance to my own prayers that I really need. But I could never pray this part of Jesus' prayer. It's unique only to himself and no one else. So for anyone who wonders, what does Jesus think about himself? Who is Jesus really? These first eight verses of chapter 17 describe his being and his work. From his own lips. Jesus pre existed in glory with the Father before the world was made. He is sent by the Father in order to make God known on earth. That's his work. That's the reason he came. As the song says, You came from heaven to earth to show the way. There is his pre existence and his incarnation in that song. And then sing it with me. From the earth to the cross, my debt to pay. That's the work that Jesus came to do in obedience to his Father. From the cross to the grave. And this is how Jesus glorified his Father, is by dying. From the grave to the sky. And that's the glorification that Jesus asks of his Father in this prayer. Now that piece is still ahead for, for him. From the grave to resurrection, Father, glorify me, is part of Jesus' prayer here. In this part of the prayer, we overhear that anyone who knows the true God and the sent Son, Jesus Christ, is given eternal life. That's, that's such an interesting definition of eternal life. 
So just take a deep breath right now. And then breathe out. For us, life is breathing oxygen. That's how we know we're alive. Life is movement, awareness of our existence, experiencing through our senses, thinking, reflecting, exploring, learning, growing. Life is what we are experiencing right now through our physical bodies. But eternal life is a different dimension of life. And it's not planted here on earth in time, but it's planted in the relationship between God the Father and his sent one, Jesus Christ. Eternal life is knowing the true God who in love sent his son so that we might know him. Eternal life is knowing and experiencing the one who is the life. And we will definitely need much more than earthly life for this kind of deep, intimate knowing because it's a knowing about the character and the being of God. Our physical life is too small of a container for that kind of knowing and experiencing. We will need eternal life because we are to know and to be in community with God the Father and the Son. Our community is to be the relationship of the Godhead. The first part of Jesus' prayer is about his relationship of obedience to God and his completion of the work that God had given him to do. He's handing over that completed task to God, even though he's not quite technically finished just yet. He still has to die and be taken to the grave. But he's handing over that completed task so that God in turn can glorify Jesus in the death he is soon to die by raising him from the dead and by putting a seal of approval on him. Jesus is conversing with his father about God's master plan of salvation here in this prayer. That's, that's a glimpse into mysteries and depths that are just thrilling and exciting. The second part of Jesus' prayer is for his disciples who are about to be tested to their utmost. So now from John 17, starting in verse 9. I am asking on their behalf. I'm not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me because they're yours. All mine are yours and yours are mine. And I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them in your name that you have given me. I guarded them, and not one of them was lost except for the one destined to be lost so that scripture might be fulfilled. Now, that was Judas Iscariot, of course. But now I am coming to you, and I speak these things in the world so that they may have my joy made complete in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they do not belong to the world just as I do not belong to the world. I am not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. Sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself so that they may also be sanctified in truth. Now, I have prayed a lot of prayers for protection in these last few weeks. It gives me so much comfort to know that Jesus also prayed for protection, and not just once, but twice in these verses. Think about the disciples hanging out with Jesus during the three years of his earthly ministry. Nothing happened to them in that time that Jesus could not handle. While he was with them, he was protecting them himself, Guarding them, he tells his father. And he did that job well, he tells his father. The disciples didn't quite know that this is what Jesus was doing, of course. And there were a few times in there when they were in trouble and they thought they were in mortal danger. One of those times they were in a boat in the middle of a terrible storm and Jesus was sleeping. They shook him awake and they say, don't you care that we are dying here? I wonder if that's 
a pandemic prayer that disciples of Jesus still pray today. Don't you care that we are dying? They didn't know then that they couldn't drown when Jesus was physically with them because they were an integral part of God's salvation plan. Jesus spoke and the waves became still. And they learned that day that Jesus was their protector from natural forces. But now Jesus is going to physically leave them. They would face danger not only from nature, not only from disease, but worse, from evil forces actively seeking their destruction as these forces are seeking the destruction of Jesus. Jesus is praying a much bigger prayer than my prayer, my simple prayer of protection from a virus. Jesus prays for protection from the evil one. That's ultimate protection. But that's not all. Jesus also prays protection for his disciples so that they may be one as the Father and the Son are one. This is protection for the unity of believers, a unity that can only come about as they are bonded to the Son and the Father. He prays for protection so that they might fulfill the destiny that God had them in mind for them to become one and through that oneness show the world who Jesus is. So what a gigantic and awesome prayer that these loyal followers might, might not just come together as one, but to be one, a oneness that goes into their being more than bone deep, more than blood deep. When two become one, the question is, which one are they becoming? Here Jesus is praying for oneness that is embedded in the relationship within the Godhead. It's a oneness that is not earthly powered and not earthly possible. It's a oneness that can only be a gift of God. So why does this oneness need protecting? Have you looked at the disciples lately, at their competitive nature, at their grasping for power, at their desire to be number one, at their confusion, at their cluelessness? If anyone is going to botch the oneness of, of God, it's going to be Peter. That's my bet. At any rate, you may differ. But we all know for sure that someone or maybe several someones in that group are going to wreck the oneness that Jesus is asking for them. So Jesus is praying for supernatural protection, for spiritual protection, for the divine gift of unity. And now we come to the third part of the prayer, starting in verse 20. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. As you, Father, are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them so that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become completely one so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that those also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory, which you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you and these know that you have sent me. I made your name known to them and I will make it known so that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Did you hear whispers of your name in that prayer? If you are a follower of Jesus, if you believe that he is God's son sent to make God known, he prays this prayer for you. This big prayer is for you and for me. He wraps us into his prayer for his closest disciples. He gives us an incredible heavenly gift of belonging, a gift of him being in us as the Father is in the Son, a gift of being loved with the same love that the Father lavishes on the Son, love overflowing, the gift of complete, notice that word, complete oneness with each other in him through the bonding 
of that love. And very importantly, this gift is not for our personal consumption, but its ultimate pur purpose is witness, sharing with others our knowing of God, our being with God, so that the world may know that God sent his son, so that the world may know that God loves them as he loves his son. What we receive in this prayer is not just for us in a closed circle, but really for the world. Wow. It sounds so good, good all the way through. It sounds so wonderful. It sounds so impossible. Once we take this prayer out of the Bible and we stack it up, put it to use in our everyday lives, when we are cranky, when we are selfish, when we're not at our best, it gets real fast. In this fractured world, our oneness as believers of Jesus is a miracle of the top order. Because nowhere else in society can we see unity across all political, economic, racial, educational, sexual lines, and barriers. God desires all ABCers to be one with him and therefore to be one with each other. His plan requires us to be one with believers beyond ABC, with the Methodists and the Catholics and the Pentecostals and the non-denominationalists. The church is supposed to be one so that everyone else says, look at them, what have they got that makes them so different? And in our oneness, they are to see Jesus. The challenge is very steep because Christ followers are so very, very different. We think differently. We don't agree with one another. And we at ABC are in the midst of exploring our deep differences when it comes to our loving of our LGBTQ plus community. So we especially know right now that we are not on the same page and nor will we be. Someone Someone among us followers of Jesus is going to muck up our oneness. Did you think of who that someone might be? I did. And I thought it might very well be me. I have that capacity, much as Peter would have that capacity. Someone in our circle of believers will mess up the oneness in Christ. So let us listen this morning to Jesus' prayer for us. He prays for us to be one. He prays for us to share our oneness with the world so that they can see him and know the Father through him. My father overheard another prayer in his youth that made an impact on him. His brother had taken a friend to summer camp where his friend received Jesus, decided to follow Jesus at that camp, and his friend's family was none too thrilled about him going to church when he came back and started attending. Well, this friend got very, very sick, and he was finally diagnosed with cancer of the kidneys. And the three of them at that point were between the ages of 18 and 20, around that young men. So my dad and my uncle Jerry took turns visiting their friend every day. I, each day, one of them would visit their friend in the hospital to pray with him and to be with him. And dad remembers him sitting hunched over, curled over as the best position to be in for his pain, the one that alleviated his pain just a little bit. And on one visit, his friend asked him to find some ice chips because he couldn't really drink water at that point. But just putting ice on his lips, on his tongue, gave him some relief. So my dad went down the hall, tried to find a nurse, find a bowl, find the ice, all of that took a while. And on the way back to the room, my dad saw that the warmth of his hand on that bowl was melting those ice chips. So he was in a hurry, he was rushing to get back into that room. But on the, at the doorway, he hesitated because he heard someone talking. So he didn't just wanna barge in there. And what he heard was his friend praying out loud. It, he didn't have any fancy prayer words. It was just a very simple 
simple talking to God, and he told God that he knew he was dying, that he didn't have long to live. And then he said, I haven't really had any time to tell other people about you. But God, here's Peter. Maybe he can tell some people about you on behalf of me. And because of that prayer and other things that happened to my dad, my dad became a missionary and told lots of people about Jesus. A prayer can change a life. Will this overheard prayer from Jesus' lips change yours? Let's bow. Speak to us, Jesus. Whisper to us, Holy Spirit. Call our name, Heavenly Father. We open ourselves right now, asking you to create this miracle of unity within me, first within us, in order to bring you glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In this time of virtual church, we had to decide whether or not to observe communion. On the one hand, communion is not meant to be taken solo. It's for all of us to come together as a community, the whole body of Christ. But on the other hand, for us as Baptists, it's a symbolic participation in a spiritual reality, which is Christ in us. And as we take the elements in us, we're demonstrating that we are accepting Jesus into our lives, that we are asking him to be the Lord of our lives, for him to be in us and live in us. So we decided that we could be together spiritually, even while each one of us is taking the elements at home. And that our oneness with Christ and with each other is even highlighted rather than diminished when we are separated by distance. So let's prepare ourselves to take communion. I've asked my dad, Peter Larson. My mom is here, Corrine Larson. I've asked Peter to pray for our elements. We bless and hallow your name. We thank you, dear Jesus, for your cross. And we thank you for that wonderful blessing that you imparted with your disciples, taking the bread, taking the wine, and saying, this is my body, and this is my blood. And so we bless you, and we humble ourselves, and we take these in as symbolizing that of taking you into our lives. Come, Lord Jesus, open our eyes, give us strength, and help us during these moments. Forgive our sins, cleanse every part of us. Might we hallow your name. Thank you again, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So right where you are, take the bread or whatever you have to substitute it. And then we're going to say this proclamation out loud. So just repeat after me. This is Christ's body broken for us. This, this is, is Christ's body broken for us. Mm And then this proclamation also, this is Christ's blood shed for us. This is Christ's blood shed for us. We thank you, our Lord Jesus, for your great sacrifice for us. You press upon us this week as we go into Holy Week your steps towards the cross, the cost to you of obedience to your Father, your determination that grew out of your great love for us, 
And we just pr pray that you would walk with us through this week and that we also would be able to walk with you through this week, this holy week. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And now for our benediction, be glorified in our homes, Lord Jesus. Be glorified in our lives, in our communities, in our nation, in our world, Lord. May you be glorified so that the world may know your love. Amen. Amen.